Okay, thank you, Fernando, for the nice introduction. Can you hear me? And thanks to Jorge and Fernando for the kind invitation. I'm very glad to be here and to have this opportunity to talk about heavy elements nucleosynthesis with radioactive beams. Actually, to be accurate, the title of my talk should be with radioactive and with neutron beams because I'm going to talk also about S-process nucleosynthesis, which involves the use of neutron beams. But you will agree with me that a neutron beam is also a kind of radioactive beam, so I prefer to keep the title simple and I leave it like this. So let me see if uh, this now is changing there. Sorry, I have to get used. Okay, now. So <clears throat> this is my outline. I will start with a very uh, general introduction and motivation to the heavy elements nucleosynthesis topic. Then in the first part of, uh, sorry, this is, in the first part of my uh, talk, I will uh, introduce the rapid neutron capture process of nucleosynthesis. Well, and I will show you some results uh, from one experiment that we did at, at ESI in Germany. And then in the second part of the presentation, I will focus in the S process of stellar nucleosynthesis. I will show you some uh, selected examples on S process nucleosynthesis. And I will try to show you uh, what are the present uh, limitations in, in detection techniques and what are the ideas to, to improve uh, these techniques in, in this field. And if I have time, I will finish with the outlook and, and, the, and the conclusions. Okay, what you can see here are two views of the same thing. This is our Milky Way galaxy in the background, and on top of it, it's chemical composition. These are relative abundances as a function of the atomic mass number. And I only want to recall here a few aspects because you have seen this slide many times. So the first point is that neutrons are actually responsible for 75% of the periodic table, which is amazing. I mean, this is a huge variety of, of nuclei that we have in our environment thanks to neutron-induced reactions, whether they are from heavy new, neutron density uh, conditions or low neutron density conditions, but they are producing actually all the elements which are heavier than iron. Still, uh, notice here the logarithmic scale, there are 10 to 12 orders of magnitude between the most abundant nuclei and the heavy nuclei. So uh, these heavy elements are something very, still very rare and, and still a precious uh, piece of information. And in these uh, small abundances, what is interesting to notice is also that there is some structure. There are some peaks there which are reflecting the interplay between uh, the structure of the atomic nucleus and also the physical conditions in the stellar environments where the, these heavy elements are produced, whether these are the giant stars or explosive stellar environments. So the idea is that if we can uh, study in the laboratory the nuclear physics uh, part, then we can learn something about those uh, physical conditions of those stellar environments. And for those of you who like the the link with the biology, I'd like to, to mention this, this publication here, which actually shows that uh, heavy elements, in particular molybdenum and tungsten, are fundamental for explaining the origin of life, even in its most primitive form. So actually trying to understand the origin of the heavy elements is something which has a, a deep a transversal impact in science in general. Okay, let me start with the rapid neutron capture process of nucleosynthesis. So here there are several candidates. Some of them you have here in this slide here. For example, uh, binary systems of two neutron stars or the neutron star and black hole. Uh, uh, other environments like supernova explosions. Uh, each environment has uh, some difficulties to be ascribed as the, as the uh, final or uh, eventual site of the rapid neutron capture process, for example, uh, mergers of neutron stars seem to uh, provide the uh, suitable uh, entropy and neutron density conditions for an air process, but the question is whether they develop early enough in the history of the galaxy to contribute to observe uh, chemical abundances that we have in our environment. On the other side, supernova uh, explosions seem to have developed properly along the history of our galaxy, but uh, latest simulations of hydro, uh, uh, supernova explosions do not reproduce sufficiently high entropy levels as to uh, be uh, uh, 
good candidates for, for the air process of nucleosynthesis. So, and of course, there is also the uncertainty of the nuclear physics input. And to illustrate this, I have picked up this publication here by Albuena Arcones and Martinez Pinedo, which corresponds to uh, long time evolutions of core collapse supernova uh, simulations. And what you can see here is uh, the so called thermal trajectory. So, so, how the temperature evolves with the time. This is a logarithmic scale. And then you can see two different trajectories depending when this uh, wind collides with the earlier emanations from the supernova. If it happens earlier, then you have a hot air process environment. If it happens later, then you have got a cold air process environment. And what I want to, to emphasize here is here in the, in the bottom picture, uh, which shows the relevant uh, nuclear reactions that are taking place over the time in the, along this evolution or this expansion of the supernova. And you can see uh, the solid line corresponds to neutron capture reactions. The dotted line uh, corresponds to photo dissociation reactions, and the dashed lines are beta decays. So at the beginning, it is mostly an equilibrium in gamma, gamma n, uh, which uh, dominates the, the, the scene. And then it is during most of the time, mainly during the late, late time of the evolution, these are beta decays which dominate the picture. So, and to illustrate this, I prepared here this, this uh, movie, but uh, because of the problems with the, with the uh, projector, I could not uh, put it uh, from my presentation, so I will try to show you another similar movie. Let me check if this works. Okay, so here we are. So at the beginning, what we have is uh, so-called alpha process, so charged particle reactions are dominating the scene because the temperature is very high. And then at some point when the expansion evolves enough, the neutrons are dominating the picture. Uh, you can see here the effect of the neutron shell closures at n equal 82, n equal 126. And when this neutron flux decays or because of the expansion, then everything decays back to stability and it is accumulated uh, there along, along the valley of, of stability. So this is more or less the, the final picture. I had another movie where you could see here also the evolution of the thermal trajectory and how the abundances go up, but uh, unfortunately this was not available. Okay, so the point I want to make here is that, uh, for example, if we look at this stage of the air process nucleosynthesis, you can see that uh, most of the nucle nuclei involved are unknown. So here you have a box, an empty cell, in uh, those nuclei which have been produced in the lab. And you can see that actually at this stage, at least most of the nuclei have not been uh, uh, produced yet. And these are exactly the nuclei which are uh, more important. Can you say one more time at this point here? Yes. What makes this boundary between hot and cold? What causes the boundary? Sorry? Yes, yes, that, that corresponds to the to the point where the uh, uh, neutrino-driven wind collides with the earlier emanations from the supernova. So if it happens earlier, then you have a, a hot environment, so you are transforming kinetic energy into internal energy, so the temperature... Uh, in yes, yes, yes. So but that, that was just one example which I pick up because it is nicely illustrated, illustrating here the, the input or the relevant input of the nuclear physics part. Yeah. So my, my message here is that uh, if you look at, at this picture here during most of the time of this expansion, it, these are the beta decays which are dominating or tailoring the final abundance pattern of, of the air process. So, here, the, the open symbols with the dot inside, they show the solar system abundances, and in blue are the results of, of this calculation, which is just one calculation to, to illustrate how, how it works. So uh, the question is, okay, here we have got a lot of beta decays, and, and the question is, how well do we know uh, such beta decays? And to uh, show you this, I, I have picked up this figure here from this publication, which shows the full nuclear chart, and here we can see that there are more or less about 6,000, let's say six, uh, it's approximate number, 6,000 nuclei, which are expected to, to undergo uh, beta decay. Hello, Henrik. Uh, now, if we look now at how many of, of those nuclei have been, have been measured in the lab, so something around 3,000, less than 3,000 nuclei, these are these, mostly these, these green nuclei in this picture here have been measured already. 
So that means, okay, we have more or less half of the information on the beta decay rates that we can get at all if we manage to produce the full uh, nuclear chart. Huh? But the point is also, uh, how are distributed these known beta decays along the nuclear chart? And this you can see here. So you have here at the beginning, at lower masses, uh, a large number of measured beta decays or measured nuclei. And then here you have a huge gap. So we can illustrate this with a kind of ignorance curve, which shows the number of unknown nuclei between this border of knowledge, between the, this, the border of this green region and the neutron drip line. So, and you can see that our, let's say, uh, ignorance on the beta decays increases uh, as we go higher in C, as we go higher in, in the nuclear charts. So the higher we go, the less, we, the less experimental information we have on beta decay rates. And of course, this has an impact when, when we do air process calculations to determine the final air process abundances. And then another effect related with this is the, the beta delay neutron emission, which I want to discuss briefly here. So this is, um, to, to explain this, I show you now this part of the nuclear chart with just one example, antimony 135. If you have simple beta decay, then you end up in barium 135. And uh, if the Q beta value of the decay is large enough, if it is larger than the neutron separation energy on the Dota nucleus, then uh, it is energetically possible that you emit a neutron. So if you populate states above the neutron separation energy, then in the beta decay, you can emit a neutron from here instead of emitting a cascade of gamma rays. And this, this in, induces a, a detour of the, of the uh, uh, air process path. Let me put it again in, in the full picture. So you can see here that at the end, you end up in channel 134. So this shifts the abundance pattern towards low, lower masses. So it has a direct impact in the final air process abundances. And also this extra surplus of neutrons from the beta delay neutron emission may induce a reactivation of, of the air process and may change the, the neutron to seed ratio. So you will see later some examples on how this, this influences. So if we go back now to, to this figure and we draw the, the number of nuclei which are expected to be beta delay neutron emitters, you can see that this is still a huge number of nuclei, around 4,000 nuclei. And this is because the neutron drip line here is very far from the stability value compared to the, to the proton drip line. And uh, this, this number here I took from this publication from Peter Muller. It is not shown because it is cut here in the bottom. But here you can see in, in black the stability valley, also the air process path. And you can see that actually all these nuclei involved in the air process path are, bit, are expected to be beta delay neutron emitters. So, and the point now is how much do we know about those uh, beta delay neutron emitters? And this is shown here. So for the moment, we have measured only about 200 of, of these cases. So we know less than 5% of the total information that we can get on beta delay neutron emission. So, um, and the point is also, how are these beta delay neutron emitters distributed along the nuclear chart? And this is shown here. So the measured beta delay neutron emitters are shown here in red. Here you have a picture of the air process path. And you can see that there is some overlap in the uh, neutron shell closures at n equal 50, n equal 82. But beyond masses of around 150, there is practically no experimental information on beta delay neutron emission. Yeah? So that means that all uh, uh, these nuclei which are here involved in the air process uh, network uh, uh, have to rely on, on theoretical predictions for uh, both for the half-lives and also for the beta delay neutron emission. Here you have a picture of how this phenomenon of the beta delay neutron emission influences the, the final abundance pattern. This is a publication from, from Rebecca Surman, and, and you can see that changing the, the, the uh, neutron branching ratios, you can change a lot, not only the, 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 the position of the third air process peak, but also the, the, the width of it. So uh, the, the point is that it is actually very difficult to get to this region of the nuclear chart. This is why uh, it has not been accessed so far. Uh, fragmentation cross-sections are very small for uh, using a primary beam of uranium or, or lead, whatever you use. When you get to this nuclei here, the cross-sections are uh, very, very small. Uh, there are good prospects in terms of multinucleon transfer, uh, transfer reactions 
uh, uh, which are, uh, uh, well, you can find more details in this publication here, but you can see here the comparison between these multinucleon transfer reactions and uh, fragmentation uh, cross sections for a uh, beam of, of lead. So there are good prospects in the field, but this is still under development. Okay, so this was essentially the main motivation why we uh, perform one experiment trying to measure beta decay half-lives and neutron branching ratios as close as possible here to the, to the neutron shell closure at n equal 126, as close to the, to the air process path as possible. But you can see that uh, uh, it is difficult to get to it. So, and to do this, what we did is to, to use a primary beam of uranium at a very high energy of about one giga electron volt, uh, uh, and at that time at high intensity, that was two times 10 to the nine particles per, per pulse. Now, this was impinging onto a beryllium target, and then here, by means of fragmentation reactions, we were producing uh, the nuclei of interest, which were selected by means of the fragment separator, uh, using the B-Row Delta A B-Row method. So this is a series of, of dipole magnets and quadrupoles, and also uh, two degraders in, in the first and the second focal planes to, to <coughs> induce uh, separation in, in, the, in the exotic nuclei. So here you can see the region that we studied in this, in this experiment here. So we were using two settings of the fragment separator, one on, on thallium-215, another one in mercury-211, which are somewhere there. And, and, and uh, what I want to mention here also at the beginning, this was aimed to be the first neutron branching measurement beyond N equal 126, or beyond the neutron shell closure. Here you have still in red uh, the nuclei for which beta delay neutron emission has been measured. And, and you can see that uh, if you look in the literature, there is one experimental value that has been reported already beyond N equal 126. This is Tallinn 210. But this is a very, very small quantity, 0.007%. So it is uh, <laughs> a very small neutron branching ratio. Uh, this is from uh, this old publication. But still, I mean, it is just one uh, value and very uh, small magnitude. So it is not sufficient to, to, to study with this uh, information how uh, theoretical models perform in, in that region. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, here you have a particle identification diagram of the nuclei that we were able to produce. In the red rectangle, you have the nuclei that we were able to really uh, measure, I mean, to implant in our detection system, which I will explain in the next slide here. So basically, we were measuring neutron-rich nuclei of coal, mercury, thallium, and lead. And uh, these uh, nuclei were implanted into a stack of double-sided silicon strip detectors where we could measure both the ion implant and the betas from the beta decay. Now, uh, by doing time correlation between implants and beta decays and selecting one specific isotope, you can determine the beta decay half-lives. This is one example of the half-life determined for thallium-213. And, uh, yeah, and then this stack of uh, silicon detectors was inserted inside a, a neutron detector, which was basically a matrix of polyethylene to thermalize the, the neutrons, which have initially a high kinetic energy, and to moderate them so that they can be detected in helium-3 tubes, which are these 30 uh, tubes that you can see there in the, in the matrix. This is the neutron detection spectrum, which is also cut. I'm sorry for this. So you, you, you cannot see the, the, the x-axis of this diagram, but it is very similar to this one. So here we have time, and, and you can see that the statistics is, is really limited because these are triple coincidences. So here we are doing coincidences between ion implant, uh, beta decay, and uh, detected neutron. But the main uh, message here is that here in the, in, the, in the background region, so correlations in the backward time direction, which are uh, actually uncorrelated events, there is no event which, which shows that the measurement is, is very clean. It has very low statistics, but it is very clean. Now, I would like to uh, summarize briefly the, the results that we got, uh, first for the beta decay half-lives, and then I will show you the the neutron branching ratios. So uh, here you can see the solid red points are the half-lives that we measured in, in this experiment with the silicon detectors for the different isotopes. Here, the, this 
red band shows the uh, neutron magic gold 126, so this uh, neutron shell closure. So we measure uh, gold half-lives on both sides of, of the neutron shell closure. And then to have the full picture, I, I draw here also the... One twenty nine. No, no. This is something which. Well, th there is some odd even effect here, but uh, this is uh, actually too low. It is much lower than theoretical expectations, as you will see later. I will compare later with with the theory. Yeah. Uh, so here you have the full picture of all the measurements that have been made in this region for the half life. So these are uh, mm, the black points correspond to two previous measurements by Anabel Morales and Teresa Kutupian Nieto from, from, from Santiago using different primary beams of gold and uranium and also a completely different analysis approach than what we used. And you can see then that when there is uh, overlap between both data sets, the agreement is, is in general quite good. So, yeah. Can you say two different experimental approaches? Are you talking about the treatment of no, I'm talking about the numerical method that they use to, to obtain the beta decay half-life. They do a kind of Monte Carlo simulation of the full experiment as a function of two parameters, which are half-life and beta detection efficiency. And then they find the minimum of, of that surface by doing the ratio of, of both simulation and measurement. And we do the conventional method of implant beta correlation. I mean, we correlate in time every implant with all the betas in a certain very broad time window. And then you got these uh, correlation diagrams that I showed before. And then we use the Batman equations to fit uh, the half-life that we extract. Yeah, yeah, the background is spill dependent, but we got rid of it by uh, doing time correlations with events outside of the spill, with beta events outside of the spill. So the statistics was, sufficient to do that. And we uh, had the experience that the signal to background ratio is beta when you do that, when you reject all the beta decay events that you have within the spill. This, we had to do both for uh, the half-lives and for the neutron branching ratios. I mean, with, with, when you have the spill, the background is so large, both of betas and of neutrons, that you cannot use it. So we only use implants from that time and decays from the time interval between, between implants. <laughs> Well, uh, there are discrepancies uh, in this case here, in this isotope of bismuth. Yeah, that's, that's quite a lot, yes. And then here, in this isotope of thallium. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we, we don't have an explanation for that. Uh, it's, it's what it is. But is the earlier data the limits are mostly statistical? Or yeah, yeah. The, the errors are mainly statistical. Statistical. You could see in the previous uh, correlation diagram how low the statistics are, and this was uh, sorry, this was uh, this one, uh, and this is one of the best cases. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, it depends on the case because the settings were not exactly the same. Yeah, but uh, in general, yes. The statistics are better. Okay, so here uh, uh, the message I wanted to, to say is that in principle there is good agreement between both data sets so we can use uh, both data sets to have the full picture of half-lives on both sides of n equal 126. In this heavy mass region, I have to say there is also a previous measurement by Lee on these two mercury isotopes which is quite off from, uh, it's not in agreement with our results, but this has been also uh, cancelled out, I mean, uh, excluded uh, from some other measurements that have been made at Isolde. So these, these values seem to be far too, too high. I mean, they are not uh, realistic. And now I come to the interesting part. Uh, the message is, okay, if we cannot get to the air process path, at least let's go as close as possible to it as we can, and let's compare with models. And then if we find any model which uh, uh, can reproduce the data well, then we can rely on it to extrapolate, to use this model to go to the, to the air process and, and predict half-lives and neutron branchings. So I compare here with, the, with one of the models that has been uh, most used for air process network calculations, the model by, by Peter Müller. Uh, this is this publication from 2003 based on quasi-particle random phase approximation for the Gamotella part of the decay and uh, first forbidden transitions are uh, included by means of 
of the statistical growth theory. And what uh, one finds here is that before the Newton shell closure, there are in general large discrepancies of about one order of magnitude in, in, in average. So uh, the model is over predicting the half-lives uh, very much. And then beyond the neutron shell closure, there is quite a good agreement between data and, and theory. Apart from the lead isotopes for the rest of, of nuclei, the agreement is quite good. Mainly for the thallium nuclei, you can see a, a very good agreement between our data and, and Peter Miller's prediction uh, uh, for, for this uh, half life of, of the thallium nuclei. So, the interpretation of this uh, based not only on our results, but also on, on uh, gamma ray spectroscopy measurements, which, which were made in the previous measurements by, by, by Morales, is that mainly in, in this quadrant here before the neutron shell closure, the transitions are dominated by first forbidden transitions. We are in this region here of the of, uh, shell model. So, uh, um, high energy transitions from the I13 half to the H11 half, P1 half, S1 half, F5 half, D3 half. These are high energy transitions which uh, dominate versus the, the only one gamma tela transition which, which is uh, taking place, which is this one, H9 half to H11 half. And this is additionally suppressed while we go closer to the C82 because this orbital becomes filled. So it is... Uh, um, suppressed in comparison with, with the other first forbidden transitions, which are much higher in energy and therefore favored. Then when you uh, pass the neutron shell closure, so you, you start to, to feel this, this, these orbitals here, then the picture seems to change completely. And it seems that there is an, uh, a very large population of the I11 half orbital, which uh, dominates this camotella decay to the I13 half. And then that means that it seems as if beyond the N equal 126 shell closure, decays are mainly dominated by this uh, gamma tela transition. And first forbidden transitions are here less relevant. They are also lo lower energy, so they are suppressed. And, and, and um, uh, this seems to explain why uh, Peter Müller's model works uh, quite well here, because uh, the treatment of the first forbidden transitions is less relevant in that place here. Yeah. But okay, the, the, the conclusion is it works quite nicely here, but it fails here before the neutron shell closure. Then we can compare also with uh, uh, self consistent uh, gamma tela and first forbidden uh, calculations uh, based on the uh, uh, Fayan's density functional by uh, Ivan Bortsov. This is this publication here, and these are the uh, down pointing triangles and you can see that in general the agreement is reasonable so this would be something this would be good in principle now the problem of of this model is that uh, it is not available for the full network so one cannot uh, use this in a systematic way over the full nuclear chart to determine half lives and, and neutral branching ratios and and this is uh, of course a pity and then we have also the latest two uh, global calculations, which are available over the full uh, uh, nuclear chart. This is this uh, Kora uh, Tachibana Yuno Yamada model Katui, which is including also a kind of improved description of, of the growth theory for the treatment of the first forbidden transitions. And here we find a, quite a good agreement for the lead isotopes, as you can see there, these are the upward pointing triangles. So here, the agreement with our data is excellent. But apart of that, in the rest of the isotopes, there is quite a large disagreement. So it is, in principle, also not a reliable model, at least in this uh, heavy mass region. Because you can see there, large discrepancies. I mean, the picture starts to get very crowded, but how you, you, you can see the, the, the up pointing triangles yeah, show discrepancies of up to one order of, of magnitude or, or even more. So what should a theorist use? What should a uh, modeler use? Which one is um, Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, uh, the most use... 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that will be, <laughs> I will come back. If you want, I, I can come back to that later. Let, let me just show the, the last model, okay? The state of the art uh, mean field calculations based on a fully self consistent covariant density functional theory. This is this publication by Marketing, Huta, and Gabriel Martinez Pinedo. This is a very recent publication, 2016, and they uh, provide data over the full uh, nuclear chart as uh, Peter Muller did. And here you can see the results. Uh, well, I don't know if you can see. So these are the square symbols. So before the neutron shell closure, in general, uh, the agreement is reasonable. I mean, there are discrepancies, but uh, of, uh, almost on all of magnitude in some uh, specific case, but in general, the agreement is not bad. But as you cross the neutron shell closure, uh, there are very large discrepancies of several orders of magnitude. So uh, we, can, we cannot rely on this also to, to perform this, this kind of calculations. So here the, the, um, um, the interpretation is that this kind of global models uh, uh, are not expected to reproduce very well the single particle energies. And in this uh, region of nuclei, which are semi-magic, then, then uh, everything, all, all, all the beta strength may be uh, concentrated in, in one peak, in, in one transition. So if this one transition is off, then you can have a very large uh, discrepancy, as, as it seems that it is the case. So the conclusion is that in terms of beta decay rates, there is no single theoretical model available over the full uh, network, which shows a reasonable performance to be used in this kind of, of network calculations. And now if, if we come to the neutron branching ratios, I will show briefly here uh, the results from, from uh, the measurement. Uh, so these are the red points here. Again, in blue, you can see uh, a theoretical predictions. This is Peter Müller's model. And, and uh, in those cases when there is a significant, in, or when there is expected to be a significant uh, neutron emission, you can see also quite uh, large discrepancies with respect to FRDM and QRTA. And probably here, the model which is performing beta would be a uh, relativistic hearty flow, hearty flow by, by, by marketing, I mean, the, the last model which I show. But then it is also puzzling why this model is reproducing more or less well the neutron branching ratios and is uh, failing so much to reproduce the half lives exactly in the same nuclei. So this is something which is very puzzling. So how, why does it fail here so much in the, in the, in the reproduction of the half lives and uh, in the neutron uh, branchings, it seems to perform well. So this is something which is uh, not clear. So also uh, the conclusions would be that, that in terms of, of neutron branching ratios, clearly we need to perform more measurements. These are, this is only, these are the first measurements in this region, but it is still a, a reduced uh, set of, of results. And, and one will need more measurement here to, to really make a, 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 a... Yeah, two neutron here is not expected because uh, yeah, the, the Kubita values are not as so large. So two neutrons, you will have to go much more exotic, much more neutral rich. Yeah? So you, you can see here what, what are the expected uh, neutron branchings for one neutron. So it is 10%. So for, for uh, two neutrons, this will be uh, even smaller. So uh, the message is we need more measurements. And one thing we, uh, we are working on is uh, this project, the beta delay neutron emission measurements at RIKEN, at the radioactive ion beam facility of, of RIKEN in Japan. And this is an, an international uh, joint effort to build the largest uh, neutron detector array in order to measure the most exotic neutron-rich nuclei, uh, for which we will use also the advanced implantation detection array, AIDA, to measure the ion implants and the beta decays. This is only, I have here only a couple of slides to uh, uh, show you a few things of, of this project. So here, you have a picture of the initial uh, detection uh, system configuration as we made at the beginning. So we have in total uh, more than 170 tubes of LM3, 
which allow us to have a really high uh, neutron detection efficiency of more than 60% of up to uh, four or five MeV of, of neutron energy, which is, which is very good. And uh, this was the initial detector design. I, I want to show very briefly also some uh, last results from uh, the work of my colleague, Adil Tarifeño. It is not shown here, but here was the reference uh, there is a, a paper uh, in preparation on, on this topic. So this is basically a geometrical parametrization of, of the detector geometry as a function of a reduced number of parameters, only two geometry parameters. And then you obtain your efficiency for all possible configurations so that you can choose the uh, best uh, compromise between efficiency, between high efficiency and flatness of the efficiency curve as a function of, of the neutron energy. So and this um, allows us to, to optimize the geometry and to use also germanium detectors to detect gamma rays because uh, uh, the geometry can be uh, very much optimized. So this is, here you have a picture of, of, the, of the project. So since the beginning, 2012, when, when it started, we have made different workshops, which are advertised here. And then we, we expect to run the commissioning now in, in autumn this year. And we have got uh, 18 days of pin time for, for experiments in Britain during this year and, and the next year. So here you have some uh, a summary of some of the, of the proposals that we have for this. And that was only some, some advertisement on, on this project. Okay, so now uh, let me switch gears and I move now to the slow neutron capture uh, process where we have much lower um, neutron densities. Uh, uh, as for example, what uh, we have during core helium burning and, and shell carbon burning in, in massive stars. Here this uh, neutron source is activated in neon 22 uh, alpha N at uh, different temperatures of 25 kilo electron volts and 90 kilo electron volts. And, uh, and due to the different temperature, we have also different neutron densities in, in these uh, two uh, stages of, of the STL evolution. And to show you how this works, I have uh, this uh, animation here, which shows a zoom of the nuclear chart. So if we start from some sieve nuclei of iron, and we start to irradiate them with these neutrons, which are produced inside this kind of stars, then you start to capture neutrons until you get to an unstable nucleus. And then the point here is that the neutron flux is so low that it will beta decay before it captures another neutron. So it is the opposite to the air process. And in this way, by means of a sequence of neutron capture and beta decay reactions, you build up all the heavy elements from uh, iron up to lead and bismuth. And then the process finishes there because beyond bismuth, you uh, uh, get to the polonium nuclei, which are alpha unstable, and then there is a recycling process going on there, and everything is, is finished. Okay, so, and then this, this uh, yields this typical abundance pattern of the S process, where you can see some maxima, which are due to the effect of the neutron shell closures here along the uh, S process path, and at N equal 82, N equal 126, which act as, as bottlenecks, and which uh, make a large accumulation of, of material there. So, and here you can see also some interesting cases. These are actually the most interesting along the nuclear chart, the branching points like nickel 63. So these are situations where uh, along the S process path, you have a competition between neutron capture and beta decay. So uh, this makes a local abundance pattern here, an isotopic pattern, which is very sensible to the physical conditions of the STL environment. For example, if you have a high neutron density, as we have during shell carbon burning, then this branch here will be forward, and then you will produce more SYNC 66 rather than SYNC 64, and the opposite. If the neutron density is low, then you produce more SYNC 64. So to, to learn about these uh, neutron densities, one needs to measure the neutron capture cross-sections of the involved nuclei. So, uh, some of the, of the hot topics which are being discussed here in, in the field right now are, uh, for example, this very strong interplay between fast stellar rotation and low metallicity, which seems to boost the production of the heavy elements by several orders of magnitude. Also, anisotropic temperature gradients inside the hot core of the stars, 
massive stars which induce very exotic circulation currents inside the star in different directions, also rotation of the inner core, and a wealth of mixing phenomena which affect to the surface composition of the star and to the abundances which are observed from spectroscopic observations. So these kind of aspects, one can try to, to understand or at least some of the physical conditions involved, involved in them if we can uh, measure neutron capture cross-sections on these branching point nuclei along the, the S-process path. And, uh, okay, you have also two different uh, environments. What I showed before was for massive stars where you have basically uh, this neutron source operating both during corelium burning and shell carbon burning. Uh, the heaviest nuclei from strontium up to bismuth, they are mainly synthesized in thermally pulsing red giant stars, uh, which are stars uh, that are burning hydrogen in a shell here on top of the core oxygen core, and, and then at some point they experience thermal instabilities which uh, activate this neon-22 alpha N uh, source and induce a further uh, nucleosynthesis at higher temperature, as it is shown there. So these are basically the two uh, scenarios of the slow neutron capture process. And as I said before, uh, what we need to know here, I mean, the nuclear physics input here, the relevant quantities we want to analyze those branching patterns are the neutron capture cross-sections. And I will show you quickly how we do this at end of. So we use the complex accelerator system to produce a pulse proton beam of up to uh, 7 times 10 to the 12 protons per pulse, which impinge onto a lead block. That was the sound of, of the proton beam impinging on, on the lead block. And, and then for each incident proton, by means of espalation, you produce 300 neutrons. So you have a huge fluence of neutrons at this place. But since we want to measure the cross-section as a function of the neutron energy, we use the neutrons which fly along a flight path of almost 200 meters. And at the end of that flight path, you set your sample and the detectors and, and you measure the cross-section. I will show you later how we do this. Uh, then. Uh, Recently, we have built also a second experimental area only at 20 meters so that we enjoy a much higher neutron flux. This is the neutron flux that we have in the experimental area as a function of the neutron energy. So we cover the full uh, neutron energy range of interest for stellar nucleosynthesis studies from one kV or from uh, electron volts up to hundreds of kilo electron volts. But of course, to be closer to the production target uh, involves also uh, higher uh, neutron induced backgrounds and, and gamma ray backgrounds. Yeah? So the aim of this is to be able to access very small uh, capture samples, samples which are available only in very small quantities like uh, radioactive samples which can be separated on, only in very small amounts and also very small cross sections like the cross sections of the neutron magic nuclei. Okay, and this shows uh, schematically how we measure these cross-sections. So, so here we have the pulse proton beam, the lead block, and the neutrons flying up to the sample whose cross-section we want to measure. And then we measure the cross-section by detecting the prompt gamma rays, which are emitted in each neutron capture event. So to measure these reactions, we actually use radiation detectors. And here you can see two of the uh, types of detectors that, that we commonly use for these kind of experiments. So here you have got the, the total absorption calorimeter of barium fluoride arrays, uh, crystals, sorry. And then you place the sample here, the neutron beam is coming from this place, and then you capture the neutrons and you measure the gamma rays from the, uh, the excitation of the compound nucleus by using these uh, barium fluoride detectors. And then we have also uh, low efficiency liquid scintillators, these are C66 detectors, they have very low efficiency, but they have the advantage that they are also much uh, less sensitive to neutron-induced backgrounds than this very uh, bulky uh, detection system that you can see there. Okay, I have just a few examples. I don't know how I'm doing in time. Is it uh, two minutes? Two minutes. <laughs> okay, so I, then I will skip the examples. <laughs> I have a couple of examples to show you, for example, how we constrain them thermal conditions in thermally pulsing AGB stars. And uh, this is a measurement we did on Samarium 151, which has a beta decay rate, which is uh, s sensitive on the temperature of the stellar environment. 
because of some excited states at low energy, which uh, decrease the effective half-life at uh, the estelar temperatures. So by measuring the neutron capture cross-section on this, and now in this dependency of the beta decay rate with the temperature, you can constrain the thermal conditions mainly during these Elim shell flashes, which occur in, in thermally passing AGB stars. This is what we do. Uh, you have here more uh, details in this uh, publication here. Then other examples on the uh, uh, cosmochronometric applications, for example, to date the age of our galaxy. Uh, this involved the measurement of the cross sections of the osmium and rhenium isotopes. So these are some very long lived isotopes that are. Uh, have half-lives comparable to the age of the galaxy. And then uh, let me show you just the latest example, as for example, this one here, which is a measurement of zirconium-93. And, and, and this is the capture yield that we measured at end of with C66 detectors. So this is the black curve that you can see here. And I want to, to uh, Pay attention here to, to this light blue curve, which is actually the, the background level that we have in the experimental area. So this is uh, the background uh, level, which is hindering the observation of more resonances or, or, or limiting our measurement here in, in the KB neutron energy range. Now, this is a nice result. It was the first measurement of this uh, branching point, and it has been recently used in combination with Hermes observations of neobium and zirconium in S-type stars to determine the temperature in thermally pulsing AGB stars independent of stellar models. This is this publication uh, which is shown there and the result is shown here. So this band here shows the abundance ratio from the observation, from the Hermes observations. So you can see a very narrow error band and this is the same ratio obtained from our cross-section measurement where you can see much larger error bands. So the point I want to make here is that um, uh, these are nice measurements because you can get very uh, nice information on the thermal conditions of the AGB stars, but on the other side, there is still room for improvement. And mainly, if we manage to treat this background level here in, in a better way, as we, as we have done so far, and like this, there are many cases. We have here 20 uh, branching point nuclei that have not been measured so far because of this uh, background, neutral induced background. And uh, so here, just to finish, I wanted to show you one idea that we are uh, developing now uh, to improve the situation here. So uh, mainly this background level uh, that I was showing in the previous picture comes from the fact that overlapping with the neutron capture reaction that we want to measure, this is this green curve here, you have the elastic neutron scattering channel, which dominates by the orders of magnitude. And that means that most of the times, the neutrons are not captured in the sample, but they are scattered and they can be captured in the walls of the experimental hole, emitting also gamma rays, which you detect in your detector. So the idea we are uh, exploring is to try to develop gamma ray detectors with imaging capability. So you can detect not only the time of and the energy of the gamma rays, but also the incoming radiation direction. And by doing so, you can determine whether the gamma ray comes from the sample, and then this represents a true capture event, or if it comes from the surrounding, and then this represents rather a background event, and it can be rejected. So, well, this was to show the, the principle of this. So basically, it is uh, the operation principle of a Compton uh, camera. So we have got here, in each event, a kind of cone of possible incident radiation directions, and then you can check whether this cone overlaps with the sample position, that's a true capture event. If not, then you react it. And, and this is uh, some Monte Carlo simulations which we have made and which show that uh, this can uh, provide up to one order of, of magnitude improvement in peak to background ratio when compared to, to conventional C66 detectors. We have got an ERC uh, grant uh, to develop and to apply this idea. And I will finish here because I think it is uh, already very late. I have here some uh, uh, examples of, of some tests that we have made to, to get evidence that, that this uh, idea is, is working. So these are tests we made at the end of last summer uh, and, and which show that actually with another detector, with a gamma ray camera, we can improve the peak to background rate ratio already by a factor of two. So we are quite confident that when we go 
to this new idea of the Compton models, we can really enhance our detection efficiency and we can access for the first time to many of these uh, branching nuclei of the S process, which are interesting to learn uh, many astrophysical aspects of, of the STL evolution. And I finish here with uh, my summary and, and the outlook, which I leave here for you to read. Thank you. Sorry for Technical question. Yes. It might be stupid, I don't know. But um, when you say um, in this last part of your talk, when you say that you have uh, following the neutron scattering, um, it was might be captured by the walls. What was the walls of the chamber? Or? No, the, these are the walls of the experimental hall mainly. Okay. Yeah, this, I mean, of course, this, this is just. Uh, one contribution to the background. It is, in many cases, one of the main contributions to the background. Uh, neutrons which are uh, scattered in the sample, then thermalized in the walls and eventually captured, because when you reduce the neutron energy, you, you enhance the, the capture cross-sections. But this is very nicely illustrated in this publication here. Unfortunately, it is not complete. Uh, here, the reference, uh, was you can see there. So th these are Monte Carlo simulations, uh, done with and without hole. So with and without walls. And you can see that exactly in the energy range of interest for astrophysics, neutron captures in the hole, so in the walls, are dominating the, the background level. Uh, and this is actually more or less the same trend that you see here in this measurement of, of Zirconium 93. Another possibility will be to ship the full detection system to the space and do it <laughs> there, but it will be much more expensive. <laughs> no question? Yes. So for the discrimination technique, for every event, do you have to assign some probability that it came from a target or that it came from the wall, or can you actually discriminate in a binary fashion? In a binary fashion? Yes or no? Uh, that is the idea. I mean, I mean the, the Problem is that uh, you have to do this discrimination. I mean, of course, there are there are many ways, but you you have to do this discrimination on even by even basis. So each gamma ray that you detect, you have to choose whether you take it or not. And that means that uh, you cannot use this as a conventional Compton camera where you make an image of your gamma rays and you say, okay, I choose only gamma rays from that uh, place or from that position. Because in, in the Compton camera, you, what you do is to overlap many of these Compton cones, and then from the intersection, you know the, the gamma ray uh, source origin. Here, not. Here, here, we have to do it on an even by even basis. And that means that uh, our main criterion is to check whether this Compton cone overlaps with the sample position. That is an advantage versus uh, ga uh, gamma imaging with, gamma cam with Compton cameras, because here we know where is our sample. So, uh, the point is that, of course, you may have a gamma ray coming from uh, the wall from here, which you will you would also take. Yeah. But, but you discriminate many of the gamma rays, like like those which are shown in this in this schematic example. So it is not that you reject absolutely all the gamma rays. No, that we could do if if, if we could have not only the cone, but the direction. So we could use, for example, a Compton camera with electron tracking that will provide us the true direction of the gamma ray. But this has a much, much lower efficiency and it will not be <laughs> convenient for this application. There are no more questions. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your attention.